couple of years having educationals about the uh, the rising, and we traveled around the state speaking at different places, and eventually we built a monument down at the Rhode Island Family Memorial in honor of the men and women who gave their lives in the cause of Irish freedom during Easter week, 1916. And we thought our work was over then, but there was such enthusiasm for uh, learning more about Irish history, Irish culture, that we continued going. And now we are here tonight for the last event of the season. We're gonna take the summer off and we'll be back in September. Since the last time we were here, in April, uh, we have a lecture by Mary Beth Lynch on the Good Friday Agreement. That was the agreement that happened in 1998, which stopped the incredible violence that was going on in the north of Ireland. Mary Beth gave a very good overview of it, its strengths and weaknesses, and it's still an item that's in the news today. On May 14th, we went down to Westerly, some members of the committee, and we spoke to a group of about 25 people down there about the implications of Brexit, which you may have heard of. Brexit is the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. There are potential devastating effects on Ireland and the six counties in the north of Ireland if the if the uh, exit, if the Brexit goes a certain way, it could bring a hard border back to Ireland, and there's no question that a hard border will result in a return to violence. So we're all hoping against that. At the end of the evening, if anyone wants to talk to me, I have information I can give you how to contact Congress people so that the American government does something to protect the interests of Irish people. On May 21st, we just had a hunger strike commemoration down at the Fairmont Memorial. We paid homage to the 10 brave Irishmen who sacrificed their lives on hunger strike, demanding political status from Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain. Um, every year we do that. It's only 37 years since that horrific event. On June 5th, which is next Tuesday, we'll have our last meeting of the 1916 committee of this year. And it will be, it's open to everybody. And what we'll be talking about is what we're gonna do next year, starting in September, with lectures just like this. And our lectures are usually held here at the Cayley Club, which is a wonderful organization. And uh, this is a great hall. There'll be music downstairs when the, the lecture ends. And one of the things that's going on at the back table, in case you haven't noticed, is a raffle. It's a 50-50 split the pot raffle. Uh, tickets are $3, and half the money will go to the lucky person whose number is drawn, and the other half will go to the Cayley Club so that we can continue having events like this. A dollar, a dollar, or six for five dollars. Okay, it's not $3, okay. My bad. <laughs> okay, we have, they have a dollar a piece. And if you're really economically minded, you get six for five. Or you can pay three for one and just see what happens. <laughs> and, uh, and all it takes is a dream and a dollar. Um, but anyway, it's, it's very important that we raise this money for the Cayley Club. They've been very good to us. Without them, we'd be, uh, we wouldn't be doing this, that's for sure. And on that note, I'm going to introduce our speakers for tonight. Uh, it's good to see a good crowd here tonight. The city of Pawtucket is well represented as always <laughs> is when Pat takes the stage. Pat and his daughter Rebecca put on a tremendous lecture earlier this year. We're expecting more of the same tonight. Pat and Mavis are going to educate us about the Molly Maguires. Amy is the technician. <laughs> And I'm not Rebecca. <laughs> in the 1860s and 1870s, the anthracite coal fields of Pennsylvania drew national attention for their violence. After a series of assaults and killings, deep-rooted fears of a secret Irish terrorist organization hardened into certainty. 16 men were assassinated, most of them mining officials. 
and there were numerous beatings and other acts of industrial sabotage. The culprits, it was believed, were members of the Molly Maguires, an oath-bound secret society imported from Ireland. Pinkerton detectives were sent into the Anthracite District undercover, and the hunt for the Molly Maguires culminated in a series of showcase trials. Twenty Irish men were convicted of a range of heinous crimes and sentenced to be hanged. Their trials and executions were the spectacular climax to a singular episode in American history one that remains shrouded in doubt and ambiguity. Tonight, we'll see if we can clear things up a bit. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cayley Club. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we have tonight, you got myself and Mavis and the Molly Maguires for the next 45 minutes, so good luck. <laughs> the term Molly Maguire is usually associated in America with a secret 19th century cult established to protect Irish Catholic miners in the anthracite coal regions of Pennsylvania. The Mollies, however, trace their origin beyond that and back across the ocean to Ireland's County Donegal, where they appeared at the, as the last of a long line of secret rural societies following in the path of the ribbon men and the white boys, hidden agrarian clubs in the 18th and 19th century. Ireland, which was, uh, 19th century Ireland, excuse me, which was dedicated to protecting Irish Catholic tenants from the capricious whims of landowners. Working covertly, each used agrarian forms of, of threats and violence to make landowners and their agents think twice before behaving too poorly with their tenants. The form of collective violence they used had a name. It was called retributive justice and was aimed at addressing violations of socially accepted ways that had developed over the years and which were understood to be fair and just. The Irish countryside in the first half of the 19th century was a place of continuous violence. And in general, County Donegal was at the top of the list of places you might not want to visit during that time. The Mollies were headquartered in a tiny village of Glen, holding meetings at Clana Mollies in Mavar Parish, County Donegal, an area near the base of the Roskill Peninsula on the north coast of Ireland, a hard, unforgiving piece of land. The fuel firing Molly Maguire wrath was the ongoing transfer of land from farming to grazing with the accompanying enclosure by fences of previously open land. The Mollies would tear down fences in retaliation and drive off or kill the livestock, or they would visit at night in women's dresses and with blackened faces and proceed to plow up the pastures. Significant numbers of Irish immigrants and Pennsylvanians came from these remoter parishes of Donegal. Native Irish speakers, as a rule, the English language failed to gain a legitimate foothold in Donegal until the 1890s. It was the kin of these Irish speakers, and not the Irish in general, who formed the Molly Maguires in Pennsylvania's coal country. The first half of the 19th century was marked by agrarian agitation in Donegal, even as the Great Hunger cut its path of death and horror. Lands in some parts of Donegal were simply too poor for anything. There was little to be gained from either consolidating plots into larger holdings or of converting from planting to dairy farm. But in the hallowed English tradition of taking bad situations and making them worse, a number of local landlords introduced flocks of black-faced sheep from Scotland in the mid-1850s and large amounts of common land on which the tenants had traditionally grazed their own animals were reserved now for sheep farming. Tracts of land were leased to grazers who came over from Scotland with their sheep, bringing Scottish shepherds along to tend them. If the animals belonging to the native Irish happened to stray onto lands they were now barred from, they were confiscated and impounded, thus ending the privilege of free commonage that had been enjoyed by these tenants from time immemorial. Irish landlords, like the oligarchy running American slave states, had inherited legal rights which, however contrary to the laws of humanity, 
they still regard it as just, simply because they were legal. Like all too many human beings, they were naturally inclined to perpetuate a system that favored them with power and ease and affluence, regarding it as a form of special divine dispensation from the powers above. A particularly violent stretch began in 1857 and lasted until 1863. Bands of men dressed in white shirts paid evening visits to the shepherds, advising them to leave the country. Several thousand sheep turned up maliciously slaughtered. Carcasses and bags of wool lay scattered in the bogs. The trouble was blamed on midnight legislators. That's true. And the term Molly Maguire's first came into usage here. Although, although there's little argument that some sheep have been killed in order to intimidate Donegal's new Scottish settlers and to encourage them to go back home, it is just as likely that other sheep simply perished trying to acclimate to the harsh conditions of Donegal, while others were stolen away by Scottish shepherds and sheep roasters. One particularly outrageous perversion of justice runs through the sorry tale of William Sidney Clements, the third Earl of Leitrim who received his title in his estates when his father died in 1848. Clemens was generally hated and despised by all who knew him. I want that carved on my stone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the dictatorial methods he used in putting his many schemes into operation caused great misery and grief among his tenants, a large number of whom he evicted. Scarcely had the new Lord Leitrim come into the possession of his estates when he set himself avowedly and deliberately to destroy tenant rights. The whole country rose in protest, but existing British laws were inadequate to protect the tenants, and the work of eviction went merrily on, with serfs being rooted out by the score. A code of draconian severity prevailed on Clement's estates, with eviction and penalty, with eviction, excuse me, with eviction the penalty for even the, even the slightest of breaches. The felling of a bush, the taking of a handful of seaweed, for each and all, the sentence was eviction. This guy was a real prince. In one case involving a man who had been evicted with his entire family, they were sheltered for a single night by the victim's own brother, but the crime was discovered and the brother was evicted also. Clement's tenants were cleared out of five of his townlands at a single blow, and at the moment of his death, a hundred of them were awaiting imminent eviction. And he made no distinction as far as religion was concerned. He evicted Catholic and Protestant tenant with equal alacrity. He evicted all of his tenants from Melmore, built a bailiff's house there, turned everything into a sheep farm, and built a high wall to keep the sheep inside and to keep the people outside. A girl in Fanard who had been employed in Lord Lightroom's house was found drowned with allegations that the Lord had, had, had seduced her. And similar allegations were made involving other girls on his estate. He was accused of a quote, repeatedly violating young girls while claiming droit de seigneur, the legal right in medieval Europe allowing feudal lords to have sexual relations with subordinate women. This caused some of his peers in the House of Commons to accuse him of immorality toward daughters of tenants and to name him the bad earl. Now, there were, a, let me cut in here, there were a few people in the surrounding area that didn't feel like the, punish, the punishment fit the crime here. About the worst thing that can happen to this guy is calling him a bad earl. But anyway, we'll get into that in a minute. So as Irish historian William Desmond O'Brien stated back in 1882, deprived of any legal recourse to address the wrongs being done them, is it any wonder that throughout Ireland, where oppressed masses strove by every illegal means to seek redress for such accursedly blighted laws. The third Earl of Leitrim was ambushed and bludgeoned to death in 1878 on his way to Milford, a village which he owned its in, in its entirety. He was buried at St. Michael's Church in Dublin amid scenes of great agitation. The mob wanted to wreak their rage on the dead body of the old Earl, as if it was not enough that he'd been murdered, but their efforts to throw the corpse into the street were in vain. A monument with a Celtic cross atop it was set up in Kindrum nearby in 1960, 82 years later, inscribed with the names of Michael Harrity, Neil Shields, and Michael McElwin. They were the Molly Maguires that killed him.
Although the Molly Maguires were never named specifically in any papal rulings, their presence in Pennsylvania was noted by detractors within the early ancient order of Hibernians, which in turn was an outgrowth of yet another Irish secret society that we have mentioned earlier, the Ribbon Men. It became of great importance in the overall strategy of the mining interests in their Pinkerton, Pinkerton detective agency cohorts to have the community at large identify the Bali Maguires, the Ribbon Men, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and the Union, the Working Men's Benevolent Association, WBA, as simply different names for the same organization. This led to the names of Molly Maguire and the Ancient Order of Hibernians being used interchangeably in the anthracite region of Pennsylvania during the 1870s, and unfortunately for those later brought to trial and accused of being terrorists, the Mollies, the AOH, and the Mine Workers Union would all be portrayed as part of a united criminal network with branches not only across the, the United States, but also in Britain and Ireland, where the ribbon men were already condemned and excommunicated. But it is probable that a few local ancient order of Hibernian lodges in the anthracite region were used for violent rather than fraternal purposes, and that the AOH was the institutional shell in which the Molly Maguires operated. Each group re required it, that its members swear a secret oath of fidelity. And this dedicated commitment to a secular authority outside the orbit of the church served as additional cause for condemnation and expulsion by the Vatican. The ideological struggles between the Molly Maguires and the Catholic Church also fell within the general framework of the church's hostility at the time to secrecy, labor activism, and violence, as well as toward the cultural practices of immigrants from the re more remote parts of Ireland. In 1850, the Vatican prefect of the Congregation of the Propaganda declared that all secret societies were to be condemned, and that secrecy itself was standalone grounds for church condemnation. The three Catholic dioceses covering the coal counties of Pennsylvania were headquartered in Philadelphia, Scranton, and Pittsburgh. The southern coal field and the western middle coal field, the only areas where the Molly Maguires were active, fell under the Philadelphia diocese. And the Philadelphia diocese was headed by one Bishop James Frederick Wood. Bishop Wood was born in Philadelphia in 1813 of English parents who had come to the United States in 1809. He was raised a Unitarian and sent to school in England from 1821 to 1827 when he moved back to Cincinnati as a bank clerk. In 1836, he seems to have found Jesus, gotten baptized as a Catholic, and gone to Rome to study for the priesthood, attending the Irish college there until he was ordained in 1844 and returned to Cincinnati. He was appointed Bishop of Philadelphia in 1857 and Archbishop of the Philadelphia Diocese in 1875. Wood's English Protestant background has often been cited as a major factor toward in his outwardly hostility, outward hostility toward the Molly Maguires. But even if we discount Wood's ethnic and cultural heritage, there's little doubt that he was quite out of touch with the rest of the ordinary Irish men and women in the anthracite coal fields, let alone the Molly Maguires. Catholic churches were being built and parishes were being formed wherever the Irish settled in the anthracite region, all under the direction of Irish priests. Wood's position was in marked contrast to the local clergy who worked and lived in the coal field parishes 
amongst the poorer Irish and Irish Americans, but parish priests were the ones responsible for enforcing Wood's decrees at the local level. In 1864, the bishop issued a pastoral letter against secret societies, which all parish priests in the Anthracite region were required to read at mass the following Sunday. Quote, it is a well-known fact, Wood began, that the church has repeatedly condemned and censured all secret societies as dangerous to civil society and injurious to the interests of religion, end quote. The church had warned its members under pain of excommunication not to associate themselves with such societies which were clearly fatal to sound faith, Christian piety, and good morals. Two thirds of those involved in the Molly McGuire actions in Pennsylvania came from the northwest corner of Ireland, and fully one third of these came from County Donegal's Irish speaking North Atlantic <coughs> seacoast, where as few as 20% attended Sunday Mass on a weekly basis, compared to as many as 80% for the rest of Ireland. There also must have been a yawning cultural chasm between the Catholic hierarchy that the Vatican had set up in Pennsylvania and these immigrants from the coast of Donegal. The version of Catholicism practiced on Ireland's northwest coast differed markedly from that being propagated in Rome and in Philadelphia. County Donegal natives living in Pennsylvania congregated with others from the same county and indeed with others from the same part of the same county. It wasn't long before the people there found themselves in conflict, not only with their employers, with British miners, and with the authorities, but also with the Catholic Church and immigrants from other parts of Ireland who had different ideas on what it meant to be Irish in America. The coast of West Donegal was described by one British observer back then as a seaboard in chaos, a dismal wilderness of bog and pool, of barren sand and naked rock, a tract of desolation in which moors, ponds, shivering torrents, drifting sands, and denuded granite are mingled in utter disarray. These Schuylkill County Irish typically had a strong sense of territory and they sought to use Molly Maguireism with its methods of social justice common in the wilds of County Donegal to recover a connection to homeland while living and working in the mining regions of Pennsylvania. Anthracite coal mining disaster struck in Avondale, Pennsylvania in 1868. The company had built a rickety wooden coal process plant, a breaker, directly above the shaft. On an early September morning, the flue partition in the shaft caught fire from the furnace. The workforce, 179 men and boys, had just descended. The fire roared up the shaft and ignited the breaker. The whole of the immense wooden structure was wrapped in flame, which arose to a height of 100 feet, swaying to and fro in the wind. The hoisting ropes and all the non-combustible material fell crashing down in the shaft, followed by pieces of burning timber. 10,000 people rushed to the scene from nearby towns to assist in the rescue, but they could not extinguish the fire in time. Rescue workers discovered the entire workforce dead behind a barricade they had built to hold back the noxious fumes and the smoke. The lifeless fathers and sons were found locked in each other's arms. Some were kneeling in prayer. This disaster led the following year to passage of a law of laws prohibiting kids under 12 years old from working inside the mines. But no rules existed concerning boys still employed on tasks outside the mines, including in this group with the unfortunate slate pickers and breaker boys. And it was common for boys as young as eight years old to work 10 hour shifts in the breakers. 
The breaker, where the varying size lumps of coal pass on belts to be broken and graded as they come from the pits, was the first place at which young boys were put to work and also the last place where many old men returned to who could no longer work hard enough or fast enough in the mines. A vivid portrayal of the exploitation under which the child workers suffered is given by a correspondent of the May 1877 Labor Standard magazine. This is his description of the breaker room in Hickory Colliery near St. Clair, St. Clair, Pennsylvania. In these works, 300 men and boys are employed. And I went, when I went through the buildings and through the mine, I saw them all. Among all these 300, although I was with them for hours, I did not hear a laugh or see a smile. In a little room in this big black shed, a room not 20 foot square, where a broken stove, red hot, tries vainly to warm the air that comes in through an open window. Forty boys are picking their lives away. The floor of the room is an inclined plane, and a stream of coal pours constantly in from some unseen place above, crosses the room, and pours out again into some unseen place below. Rough board seats stretch across the room, five or six rows of them, very low and very dirty. And on these the boys sit and separate the slate from the coal as it runs down the inclined plane. It is a painful sight to see the men going so silently and gloomily about their work. But it is a thousand times worse watching these boys. They work here in this little black hole all day and every day, trying to keep cool in the summer, trying to stay warm in the winter, picking away among the black coals, bending over till their little spines are curved never saying a word all the living long day. I stood and watched these boys for a long while without being seen by them because they had their backs to the entrance and the wall that they faced was blank. The coal makes such a racket that they cannot hear anything a foot away from their ears. One result of their efforts is the clean free coal that burns away into ashes in our gratings at home. Another result I found in the little miners graveyard right next door to the pretty little town church where every other stone bears the name of some little fellow under 15 years of age. This was in St. Clair, Pennsylvania. The Working Men's Benevolent Association, the WBA, was founded there in 1868. Branches of the new union appeared in the rest of Schuylkill County later that year, and by 1869, there were WBA locals throughout the Anthracite region. But there were important, and so, uh, important social distinctions within the ranks of Pennsylvania's anthracite coal miners, even within the union. Women for openers were never employed in the anthracite mines, so the most obvious division was between the men and the boys. In Schuylkill County alone in 1870, out of 22,000 miners, 5,500 were boys between the ages of seven and 16. And the mines themselves had a work hierarchy that was firmly set along ethnic lines. The skilled miners, the elite of the workforce in the mines, enjoyed a great deal of comparative independence and exercised considerable control over their work day. They were paid by the tonnage of coal they produced. They were selling a product, and not just their labor, to the operator. Next in line, but far below the skilled miner, came the mine laborer. Once a skilled miner had done his job, he was free to leave the mines. The laborer stayed behind to shovel the coal into cars for transport to the surface, <coughs> piling the waste to one side. Look again at the unfairness of the system to the laborer who has to fill from six to seven cars a day with coal, and he gets but a third of the wages of the skilled miner. The miner and the laborer each go to work at seven o'clock in the morning, and probably the miner will cut enough coal by 10 or 12 o'clock. Then he will go out, leaving the poor laborer up to his waist in water and having a pile of lumps to fill three or four cars with coal after the skilled miner has left. Between five and six p.m., the laborer, poor thing, arrives home wet as a fish. Thus, the mine laborers found themselves in a situation markedly inferior to that of the skilled miners. And in many cases, they worked directly for the miners rather than for the mine operator. And as we mentioned earlier, the social position of the mine laborer was indeed far below that of the skilled miner. And to make their position even harder to bear, there was a well-established apprenticeship system in place through which Welsh, British, and American mine workers could rise up from mine laborer to skilled miner. 
but the Irish were not allowed to participate. In essence, no Irish need apply. So the work Iraqi in the mines extended from native-born Americans at the top, and after them down through the English, the Welsh, and the German immigrants, and finally down at the very bottom to the Irish. Unskilled and often despised, the immigrant Irish laborers, Irish mine laborers were the most transient of all who worked below the ground. And the tension between British and Welsh skilled miners and Irish mine laborers eventually took the form of street warfare between rival British and Irish gangs, including a series of beatings, assaults, faction fights, and killings that were blamed on the Molly Maguires. The Molly Maguires' failure to conceal the identity of their members along with their failure to conceal their plans of operation led directly to their undoing. The environment that the Mollies operated in left absolutely no margin of error, and the subsequent revelation of a membership list inevitably doomed those whose names were upon it. The organization left little evidence research historians might use later on, and so a great deal of what has been accepted as fact about the Molly Maguires is derived from a very questionable source. The writings by editor Benjamin Bannon, who ran the newspaper The Miners' Journal, for 44 years, starting in 1829. An American nativist, Bannon successfully published and sold his Republican newspaper in an area that was solidly democratic. He printed strong anti-slavery broadsides, while at the same time dedicating equal space to virulent denunciations of the Irish Catholic immigrants swarming into post-war Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. Bannon lived by a naive interpretation of free labor. Where the interests of the capitalists and of the laborer are in perfect harmony with each other. As society prospers, laborers will fulfill their goal of becoming capitalists and all will live in harmony. The gist of this was that a man who started work as a mine laborer could quickly graduate to a position of skilled miner, and then in turn go on to become a mine operator, and this is for himself. But guess what? That's not how it works. A study of Irish sympathies and actions during America's Civil War is bound to leave you scratching your head. Early on in Pennsylvania, the Molly McGuire's were noted as much for their anti-draft anti-conscription activities as they were for leading the labor battles in the anthracite coal fields. The anthracite region was quick to respond when Abraham Lincoln issued his April 1861 proclamation calling for 75,000 troops to defend the Union. Within two days, two companies were on their way from Schuylkill County, and within, within a week, 22 companies, a total of 1,860 men, had left for Washington. Pennsylvania's 48th Irish Regiment saw bloody action in the Second Battle of Bull Run, Fredericksburg, the Wilderness, Cold Harbor, and the Battle of the Crater. And yet Pennsylvania was in a notably precarious position at the beginning of the Civil War. It boarded Delaware and Maryland, each neutral and slaveholding, and was itself a prime target for Confederate invasion. Think of the Gettysburg invasion here. Schuylkill County somehow remained Democrat and anti-war, despite the fact that 320,000 Pennsylvanians fought in the Union Army and Molly Maguire policies accurately represented the thinking of a majority of Schuylkill County's Irish mine laborers who opposed Lincoln's war effort as much as for pro-slavery reasons as for anti-conscription and anti-draft reasons. The two federal policies that raised the most havoc in the coal fields were the Militia Act of 1862, authorizing state constructions conscription drafts to supply needed manpower, followed by the Federal Conscription Act of 1863, which set up an elaborate federal system for conducting the draft. The chief cause for hostility to this later law, and the part that also brought on the horrible race riots in Manhattan, 
was its provision allowing the well-to-do to either find a substitute to take their place or to pay a commutation fee of $300 in order to avoid serving in the army altogether. During the 1864 election, 82% of voters of the most heavily Irish town in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, a place called Cass, voted Democrat, and Molly Maguireism expanded to cover a new form of popular Irish protest that included draft resistance alongside labor activism. There were two particularly interesting assassinations during this period that were attributed to the Mollies and for which alleged members were later executed. The first was the death of mine foreman Frank Langdon an 1862 killing used 15 years later to execute, execute John Kehoe and a suspected ringleader of the Molly Maguires. Langdon was mine foreman where Kehoe worked and Kehoe, according to testimony of a paid informer, had allegedly threatened to kill him a few weeks earlier after his pay had been docked, a pretty shaky basis were hanging a man, a man 15 years down the road. Then, in October of 1862, the Federal Draft Commissioner encountered sporadic hostility as he tried to take a census to locate conscripts that he could draft. When he announced his list later that month, grievances against the new draft exploded into violence. Women and boys threw hot water, rocks, and stones at him and a huge crowd that had stopped a train transporting draftees from Schuylkill County to Harrisburg backed off under the threat of federal troop intervention. The Catholic Church also injected some powerful moral oversight. The Catholic Bishop of Philadelphia, began a story in the Miner's Journal, visited this region last week and administered some wholesome advice to men recently engaged in the disturbance here. Bishop Wood told them of their duty under the law as good citizens, and on Sunday last, a priest in every borough and county preached strong sermons on the subject. A second assassination bearing the marking of Donegal's wretched justice occurred in November 1863 also in the town of Cass. A party of cross-dressed men with blackened faces broke into the home of mine owner George K. Smith and shot him dead. Blame initially was laid at the heels of labor agitators attempting to halt coal production for better wages and conditions, but a more pro probable cause was that Smith had willingly assisted draft conscription authorities by providing lists and addresses of all the men in his workforce. He not only furnished this information, but at the same time, he also entertained 40 U.S. Army cavalrymen on his property while they tracked down some of the less than enthusiastic prospective conscripts. Soon Smith was receiving threats on his life, and about a week later, he was dead. The Smith killing involved both a labor dispute and a social issue, that is, the opposition to the federal military draft. In cooperating with military authorities, Smith had transgressed the moral and social code of the local Irish residents who resisted the draft. And the manner in which the offended parties enforced their vision of justice conformed closely to the model established in the Donegal countryside. In 19th century Pennsylvania, the state delegated the power to create an area's police force to private corporations, taking little or no interest in the matter thereafter. In substance, the practice from 1871 to 1929 was simply a contract between mining companies and the state, creating islands of police power which were free to float as the employers saw fit. Such were the legislative origins of the famous coal and iron police of the Reading Railroad. 
The police powers at its disposal were unlimited. In the, in the climactic year of 1875, the Coal and Iron Police would join forces with the Pinkerton Detective Agency as the new Flying Squadrons formed for the specific intention of rooting out the Molly Maguires. In 1876, Charles Sharp and James McDonald, both of whose, whose both of whose names strongly suggest a Donegal connection, were arrested for the murder of George Smith. They were tried, found guilty, and executed on the testimony of a paid informer, Charles Mulhern. There were six other Civil War area, era assassinations blamed on the Molly Maguires, each of which resulted in questionable convictions and summary executions up to a decade and a half later. Throughout the Civil War, political and military officials equated labor activism with draft, draft resistance so that all forms of social disorder, especially strike activity and attempts to form labor unions could be construct, construed as equally disloyal, disloyal to the Northern cause. And the Catholic Church's initial attempt to thwart the Mollies over the 1863 draft continued unabated on a host of other issues until the Molly Maguires had ceased to exist. Specific territorial and regional issues were of greater importance to the Molly Maguires, both in Ireland and in America, than, they, than, than were any abstract feelings of Irish nationalism. The laws in place in each country were equally incapable of protecting them from the vested money interests who were running things. And the Irish coal miners' preference for militant action to improve their lot exposed them to no greater risk than they had faced reporting to work each day. Strategies used in Pennsylvania and in Ireland were strikingly similar. Even though the battles in Ireland were fought on the farms and the battles in Pennsylvania were fought in the coal mines. The enemy in Ireland was the absentee landlord, his magistrates and his policemen. The enemy in Pennsylvania was the corporate mine owner, his magistrates and his policemen. All 20 of the Mollies who were executed in the 1870s had been members of either the Ancient Order of Hibernians, a fraternal organization, or the Working Men's Benevolent Association, a miners' trade union, and sometimes both. Connecting the AOH and the WBA to the Molly Maguires was critical to the success of the conspiracy theory being pushed by capitalist policymakers because it portrayed the Mollies as but a militant labor arm of an established international terrorist network. Ironically, although the WBA union undoubtedly did include some Molly Maguires among its members, its leaders were avowed opponents to any kind of violence and strongly disassociated itself from any Molly Maguire activities. The two represented fundamentally different answers to the same question. How can we improve the terrible conditions of life and labor in the anthracite regions of Pennsylvania? And unfortunately for miners and those who depended upon them, the mine corporations had total control of the message. The misinformation that they spread, linking the three groups together, was pretty much accepted as fact and would eventually lead to the death of both the Mollies and the WBA, while also weakening considerably the independence of the ancient order of Hibernians. The final straw with the Ancient Order of Hibernians was its 1876 decision to officially disassociate itself from the Molly Maguires so that it could resolve its decades-long conflict with the Catholic Church, something it came to view as necessary for its very su survival. The AOH wrote into the minutes of that year's convention held in New York City that this order no longer recognizes any connection with that terrible band of misguided men, the Molly Maguires. 
So what had changed in the anthracite coal regions of Pennsylvania since the end of the Civil War? Why was there a period of labor peace from 1869 to the mid-1870s? And why did that period of peace come to an end? An easy explanation is that the bloodshed in the coal fields disappeared with the arrival in 1869 of the Working Men's Benevolent Association, and that it recommenced with a vengeance in 1875 when that union ceased to exist. The WBA had somehow been able to align the needs of the skilled miners to control the output of coal with those of the mine laborers to limit their workday to eight hours. And the seven year period of peace during the Working Men's Benevolent Association's existence neatly falls between the first wave of Molly Maguire violence in the 1860s and the second wave of Molly Maguire violence in the 1870s. Also during this relatively peaceful period, the anthracite mines were being run by a group of smaller independent mine operators, most of whom had worked their way up through the various stages of the work in the mines. But all of this ended with the arrival of Franklin Gowan and his Reading Railroad. Okay, I got one section left, and then Mavis is going to give a brief conclusion, but uh, this one's a tough one. Franklin Gowan was born in Mount Airy, Pennsylvania in 1836, the son of an Irish Protestant who immigrated here prior to becoming director of the Bank of Pennsylvania. The younger Gowan became a lawyer in 1860, leading to his election as district attorney for Schuylkill County in 1862. In 1863, he became one of many wealthy residents who paid $300 in order to avoid serving in the Army. Prior to joining the legal team at the Reading Railroad in 1864 and becoming head of its legal department in 1867, he was a beguiling Irish politician, an eloquent Fourth of July orator, and a shrewd district attorney. In 1870, he became the railroad's president and the ambitious ruler of the, road, of the Reading Railroad Empire. Pennsylvania's coal fields were owned mostly by small-scale ex-miners, but Gowan and the Reading Railroad changed that by purchasing all of the existing Schuylkill County coal mines from them. He then forced unilateral wage reductions upon the Working Men's Benevolent Association in 1875, causing what was later referred to as the Long Strike, a work stoppage that lasted from January to June of that year and resulted in the total defeat and collapse of the WBA. After barely four years as its chief executive, Gowan had successfully achieved the, monopol <coughs> the monopolist dream, complete vertical integration of an industry. He controlled every facet of coal from the shovels that took it from his grounds and threw it into his rail cars running on his railways to the shovels that took it out of his rail cars and threw it into somebody's residential, home, or industrial firms. He had not only achieved a virtual monopoly over coal transportation to and from the anthracite region, but he also acquired more than 100,000 acres of prime coal land and secured control of all phases of the selling markets in Philadelphia. But he turned out to be more of a Bernie Madoff type of <laughs> robber baron than uh, the, more, the other more successful money-making savants of that period, like Vanderbilt, Carnegie, Astor, and J.P. Morgan. Gowan's pyramid eventually collapsed, and he claimed bankruptcy and went into receivership in 1884. He blew his brains out on December 13, 1889. There was some speculation that he may have been murdered by the Mollies. But Gowan's family squashed this by reporting that he had been acting queerly for some time now, and that a strain of hereditary insanity had earlier been detected. <laughs> when the Molly Maguire got active again in 1873, it was just when the Pinkerton Detective Agency needed them most. On the verge of bankruptcy, Alan Pinkerton's agency had originally been hired by Franklin Gowan 
for the lowly task of sniffing out conductors who are collecting fares and parking them for themselves. But the Reading, the Reading soon found itself in need of more sophisticated assistance to protect its coal properties. Undercover Pinkerton agents were dispatched in the summer of 1873 to investigate the beatings of mine supervisors, derailing of coal cars, and the burning of coal supplies. And in October of that year, the operatives reported the rumored existence of an organization known as the Molly McGuire. Gowan and Pinkerton agreed to send a detective into the anthracite region, undercover, to try and infiltrate the Molly Maguires. And the man they chose was James McParlin, a Catholic native of Coney Armagh, located in the heavily Protestant province of Ulster in Ireland. McParlin left Ireland at 19 to work in England, left there for New York City in 1867, and left New York soon after for Chicago, where he opened up a combination liquor store saloon in 1869. He lost everything in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 and began on Pinkerton's lowest rung that same year, watching conductors suspected of pocketing fares. But after noting his Irish background, Pinkerton and McFarland right, Pinkerton had McFarland write down all he knew of the Molly McGuire's. And two days later, McFarland submitted an eight page report on them. He was hired then and there and left the coal fields dressed as a tramp. Like most of the detectives of the time, McPollin was just a rat. And few figures in Irish history are more despised than rats. Those with whom he should have shared a bond of blood, a bond of soil, and a bond of cultural history meant nothing to him. And McPollin set about betraying them for a price, for his price. And his price was $12 a week. Once in Pennsylvania, he frequented Skyco County's inns, cabins, and shabines, seeking places where the ancient order of Hibernians might gather, starting with the Sheridan House in Skyco County. McPollin assumed the role of the wild Irish lad, buying rounds for the boys, dancing a jig or two, getting into fights. He spoke fluent Irish and managed to con just about everyone. Closing in on the AOH, he moved on to the town of Shenandoah in January of 1874. He lived in the family quarters of the tavern keeper Muff Lawler, above the saloon that Lawler ran. Lawler was master of membership of Shenandoah's ancient order of Hibernians. Shenandoah would be McPowell's base of operation for the rest of his stay in the coal fields, and he reported back to Pickering that he had, at last he had found the source of the Mollies. He was soon initiated into the Shenandoah Lodge of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, swearing to be true and steadfast <coughs> to the brethren, brethren of this society dedicated to St. Patrick, the holy patron of Ireland, in all things lawful, and to propagate friendship and brotherly love. McParlin paid $3 initiation fee and his 35 cents monthly dues, and received the passwords, the signals, and the counter signals. The long, unsuccessful 1875 strike that had killed the WBA and opened things up for the Mollies to be the miners' last resort. McCollin, McCollin became the trusted secretary of the Shenandoah Lodge of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, at times filling in for the master of membership, a position giving him advanced knowledge of assassinations. He supposedly tried to warn Pinkerton of planned assassinations, and this gave rise to suspicions that McCollin was, in fact, an agent provocateur, encouraging the Mollies to commit crimes. He allegedly allowed murder plots to ripen in order to obtain evidence he could use for later convictions. The Mollies eventually became convinced there was a traitor, a traitor in their midst and began suspecting McCarlin, who could feel things starting to close in around him. He had been inside the Mollies for three years and learned all he was going to learn. He knew it was time to get out if he could. The Mollies had set up an ambush for McCollin, but he escaped by sleigh on March 7, 1876, across the frozen countryside with an army of Molly Maguires in hot pursuit. But he got away. In conclusion, McFarland's testimony, supplemented by a series of paid informers who had turned state's evidence could be directly credited with nine of the 20 men convicted as Molly Maguires and sentenced to die by hanging. 
Indirectly, he also paved the way for executing 11 other men, sentencing 26 more to terms in county jails, and putting a price on the heads of nine or 10 fugitives. By any legal standard, these trials were a travesty of justice, conducted under media coverage clearly hostile toward the defendants who had been arrested by private policemen and convicted on the evidence of a detective who was probably an agent provo provocateur. Irish Catholics were executed, I'm sorry, Irish Catholics were excluded from all juries as a matter of course. Most prosecuting attorneys worked for the Reading Railroad, and the chief prosecutor at the great showcase trials was none other than Franklin Gowan himself, president of the Reading Railroad. As one historian has so aptly put it, a private corporation initiated the investigation through a private detective agency a private police force arrested the supposed offenders and coal company attorneys prosecuted them. The only thing provided by the state of Pennsylvania was the courtroom and the hangman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good job there. Um, as I said earlier, this is our last lecture for this season. We'll be back in September. I just want to really compliment Pat Brady, who's been a tremendous addition to the 1916 committee, whose research is so in depth, and the presentations that he's done have been so interesting. It's just great. I hope next fall Pat's lining up again and raising his hand and volunteering <laughs> to do things. <laughs> and how about Mavis for getting So uh, just a couple of uh, business things here. Don't forget we have a 50-50 raffle in the back. This is important that we support the Cayley Club. Without this hall, we'd never be able to do what we've been doing for the past four years. And we want to continue you know, on this kind of educational journey that we're taking both looking back into the past in Irish-American history